I want to share something real quick before we uh, start our study. Uh, Jan and I had the privilege of going over to uh, her family's uh, gathering uh, yesterday for Christmas. And uh, in going over there, it, uh, it was a time where we saw people that we hadn't, uh, family that we hadn't seen in forever and ever. And uh, that's always kind of interesting uh, to me uh, as to how that's all going to work when you haven't gathered for years and years and years. And uh, as we went there yesterday, uh, everything was just uh, incredible. The meal, the fellow, the meals, the fellowship, everything was good. But one thing I want to encourage you in is if you're going to be with family or friends this year that you haven't seen in a long time, as best as it is up to you, take that extra step and make them feel that they're loved, they're wanted, they're missed, and they're valued. And for us at Christmas, uh, for those um, who are Christ at Christmas, uh, we, we know how much the Father desires fellowship with us. We know how much his Son uh, came and, and desire to uh, restore our relationship with the Father through his uh, death and his resurrection. And we can understand these things in part of our scriptures this morning uh, due to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. And so it's important. A, a, a lot of the folks this time of year feel downtrodden. They feel unloved. They feel that uh, their worth is simply as an employee. Uh, their worth is simply as something else. But we have a unique opportunity, um, uh, those divine appointments that God brings uh, around us this time of year. Um, pray. Reach out your arms. Use words of encouragement. Um, and if you, uh, if you encounter Eeyore, you know what? Double down and love him twice as much in that. And so... Just want to uh, just want to encourage you guys in that. So this morning uh, we are going to be in Romans uh, chapter eight verses five through eleven, continuation of uh, last week's message, His Spirit who dwells in you. So I'm going to start uh, chapter eight verse one and read through eleven just because it gives it a sense of continuity. So chapter eight um, verse one Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because of the carnal mind, or because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. So the, the crux of what Paul is, is bringing forward to the church, the crux of what he's saying is, is that you either have the Holy Spirit within you, which uh, is to you the confirmation, the encouragement that you do have the eternal life in Christ, or you don't have the Holy Spirit within you. So there's not, it's not an option box you check. It's like, yeah, I got enough holiness in me. Don't need that Holy Spirit thing going on right now. What are you going to do away with that? No, it's to every New Testament believer who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon them and into them. And that's how you know that you know that you know. 
And, and that's the message that, that Paul is bringing forward this morning, that if you have the Holy Spirit within you, then you don't have to walk in the ways of the world. You don't have to, as a dog returns to its vomit, you don't have to play that, play that tune. And it's important for us, I believe, to really understand that because we are in the midst of a world that's dying. We're dying too, right? We're, we're dying as well. The world's dying, we're dying. Um, but we're not dying an eternal death. They're, they're dying an eternal death if they don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So as, as we have the Spirit within us, we need to take full advantage of the Spirit illuminating Scripture for us. The Spirit guiding and directing us. The Spirit strengthening us. The Spirit saying, hey, remember? Remember back? You remember back when, when, when we didn't hang out together? Remember the things that you did? We well, can remember them, just don't do them, right? I mean, just don't do them, don't partake. And so as we go um, forward in our study this morning, uh, verses 5 through 11, um, just think about the blessing that you have being his. Go outside today when we, when we leave the sanctuary, and look at all of his creation breathing. That sounds funny, right? Look at the sky, it's breathing. Look at the mountains, they're breathing. Look at the birds, they're breathing. Look at the, the foliage, it's, it's breathing. Look at those that you see, they're breathing. And, and all of life is singing praises unto the Lord if you listen carefully, if you focus succinctly. You can take and drink that in, and you can be encouraged, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, right? We have those. We're in the midst of those. Those things seek to take us and weigh us down, but yet what? He who's within us is greater than what? He who's within the world. So look at the grandeur and the glory of God in all that he allows you to see. Reading out of Psalm chapter 1. Verses 1 through 6. Scripture tells us, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly, listen to this, the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know what? We should not desire that any should perish. It's not up to us to save people, but it's up to us to be what? Good table waiters. It, it's up to us to bring forward the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and then leave it there. We don't have to embellish. We don't have to take and uh, tag on some promise. Yeah, you know what? You accept Jesus Christ, man, all this stuff's going to go away. You will be like a new guy. No more deaths, no more problems, no more bill collectors, no more disease, no more. You'll love your boss for a change, you know? I mean, no, man, that's not what we're peddling, right? We're peddling a reconciliation with the Father through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. And, you know, the enormity of what um, we can understand and experience um, in God's Word is as we learn this year anew of His love for us. I mean, think of, think of God in the manger, right? I mean, we, we look in the manger and we think, oh, it's a little baby in the manger. That's kind of cute, right? But no, it's God in the manger. That's God. That's Jesus Christ in front of in the manger. By him and through him and for him, all things held together, even as an infant. And, and that just goes, that just explodes with, with truth. So as I read uh, verses 5 through 8 of our study this morning, the scriptures say, for those who live according to the flesh, 
set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So the, uh, the two opposing thought processes. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Once again, two, two juxtapositions here. Uh, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor need can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you want to please God? Do you want the Father to love you? Do you want his Son, who's at the right hand, making intercession for you night and day? Do you want the Son to say, and I'm so glad I gave my life for them. Do you want that? Just be obedient. Be obedient to the things that he calls you to do. Now, I'm not going to get up here and say, well, you know, here's the list. Boom, 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 boom. Then I guess I get to be a legalist if I do that, right? No. You know what God wants you to do. You know what you're doing that you shouldn't do. You know what you should be doing that you're not doing. And you know what you're doing that you give him praise, glory, and honor for because he's enabling you to do it. Verse 8 of what I just read. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what we eat, how we exercise is generally evident in how our physical health plays out. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that from up here. I'm bringing that forward. What you eat, how you exercise, what you do is generally apparent uh, visually. But listen to what we're told here. To be carnally minded is death. It works out the same way when you don't seek God, when you don't uh, desire to be obedient to the Lord, when you do those things that you find um, satisfying, not the things that he desires for you to do. We're told to be carnally minded is death, spiritually minded is peace, uh, carnal mind is at enmity or war with God, and we're in the flesh, we cannot please God, no matter how hard we try to deceive ourselves. You ever do that? Well, it's not a big deal what I'm doing right now. I've done this for years. No, I'm saved, I know it. The Holy Spirit's in me. I accept, yeah, no, I'm good. I continue in this because, you know what, I mean, it's just between me and nobody else. I, I just do what I do because I can do it. And No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You know, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 18, Scripture says, They say, then walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you were led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You know, one of the things I thought uh, prior to Christ was that um, Jesus was a cosmic killjoy. It's like I'd look at uh, those that I actually had a sense that they might be saved, that surrounded me, and I would think to myself, well, they, they don't talk like me. How can that be fun for them? They don't drink like me. How, how, how can that be fun for them? They don't do those things that, that I do. How can they possibly be having fun in life? And I'm thinking to myself, why would I want Jesus Christ in my life? I'm having too much fun. Well, my carnal mind really directed all of how I lived. And as soon as the Lord and his benevolence toward me, poured out his Holy Spirit upon me, I realized that life began with Christ. Life begins with Christ. And the old man was nothing but the old man. The old man was simply a liar and a cheat and a, a conniver and a stealer. And, and so we want to not be carnally minded because it's death. We want to be spiritually minded because we're told that is life and peace. And uh, reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, Scripture says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body than to be present from the Lord. 
So this verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And, and that's, that's what we're called to do. We walk by faith and not by sight. And it's hard to walk by faith if you've been blinded to the things that God has done in your life because simply life has allowed you to be distracted, right? I mean, I'm always amazed when I talk to people. It's like, what's God doing in your life? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. Must be doing something because I'm still here. Okay, but, but what's he doing with your family? What's he doing uh, in, in the workplace? What's he doing in the community? What's he doing in your fellowship? What they... I don't know. I just I haven't paid attention to that. Come on! Your, your life is in Christ. Your life is centered there. You, you, you can't. We walk by faith and not by sight. And if you're waiting to see something before you walk obediently, it's, yeah, that's not how that works. Galatians 5, verses 22 through 26. And I think some people might disagree with me, but I'm going to put my foot in my mouth and say this before I read uh, the scripture. Notice that it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the bill. Notice it's not fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit singular of the Spirit. Read out of the Galatians 5, verses 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, I view those things that are fruit of the Spirit as Spirit brought forth, Spirit enabled, uh, the Spirit bringing these all together. And the last one, I, I love. I love the last one. Self-control, right? And you can't pick and choose. It's not like a breakfast buffet. You can't go in there, well, I'll choose this one, I'll choose this one. No, you, you have to take and possess these things Self-control being the wrapper that, that brings it all together, and Scripture goes on to say, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Galatians 6. Verses 7 through 8, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting. We talked about this last week. Unfortunately for some, yes, being a Christian is a participatory party, right? You actually have to do something to be part of the body of Christ. And that isn't to secure your salvation. That isn't so you don't lose your salvation. That isn't so you don't have to earn your salvation. What that simply means is God has sent forth his son, right? And in that, his son was obedient to what? The will of the Father. And as God so loved that he so gave, as Jesus so loved that he so did, is the Holy Spirit now dwells within those who are His. This is something that, that you participate in because you love the Father. You love what He's done for you. You love the Son. You love what Jesus is doing for you. You love the Holy Spirit because when you're in those moments of trial, moments of tribulation, moments where... You just want to take and grab your blankie and curl up in a ball and say, I'm done with life. We're not playing this game anymore. The Holy Spirit illuminates God's word. He encourages you. And, and in that, what an incredible Savior we have. The mark of someone who is saved is evident by the indwelling and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We can say that the Holy Spirit involves us, but is there any outpouring? 
Is there any outpouring that brings the glory to God, not, not to us? Read it out of 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So what has been committed to us? The word of reconciliation. God did not send his son into the world that the world, what, might be condemned, but that the world might be saved, because the world's condemned already. I spoke about this last week, and, and so I'm going to speak about it again this week. Those that were drawn to, to minister to, those that the Lord puts in front of us who... Um, don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You can't take and do something opposite of what God said he, he sent his son into the world to do. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. The world's already dying. It's already going to hell in handbasket. What we're to do is bring the living gospel to those that are perishing. What we're to do is be good table waiters and present that and uh, tell them of God's love for us through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. But, but we can't go, well, you know what, you're, you're drinking like a fish. Uh, maybe you should slow it down and drink like a guppy. You're, you're, smoking, you're smoking way too much. I mean, this is never going to find you favor with God. Oh, and by the way, you know, that whole smoke thing that's coming out of your mouth. Yeah, the words aren't too nice either. You need to tell that program down. See, see, those who need Christ, they're sinners, just like us. If those who need Christ waited for themselves to be gutted and cleaned and good and dressed up and holy and ready to go and without any tinge of sin, would they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? No. I mean, if you could self-clean, who needs Jesus? You can be self-righteous, who needs Jesus? But what we have to do is bring the gospel and let our Lord and Savior meet them on the ground that they're at. Let our Lord and Savior do that work in their heart, in their lives. And I'm not saying you condone everything anybody does. I'm not going that direction either. But the whole purpose of salvation is what? To be reconciled to God. The whole purpose then is to as individuals, see what the Lord would have us do. Verses 9 and 10 of our study this morning. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So once again, are you saved? Have you been redeemed? How do you know it? Well, the Holy Spirit dwells in us according to what happened what, at the day of Pentecost. Isn't that incredible, the day of Pentecost? The outpouring of God's love for his people as he poured out the Holy Spirit upon them and, and within them. Reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. That if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who is prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Verse 6, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home 
In the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. You know, the older I get, the more I appreciate God's provision for me. You know, and and the more I understand that sooner, every day goes by, sooner rather than later, I'm going to be hanging with my dad, my brother, my granddaughter, you know, just so many other saints that accepted the Lord. And uh, in that, uh, just wondering, Lord, when? When? What night am I going to go to bed in my bedroom and wake up in the throne room, right? So we're here, though, right? We're here. So we can look forward to those things, but we, we have to live in the moment, because this is the moment that, that he has for us. We have to walk by faith, not by sight, knowing that there is a plan, there is a purpose, and God, God is going to bring that to fruition. Our last verse of the morning, verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life through your mortal bodies, through the spirit who dwells in you. Alive in Christ, dead to the eternal effect of sin. Oh, what a Savior, right? Oh, what a Savior. As the worship team comes up, and I close out with a couple of scriptures, I want to read out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Acts 2, verses 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by all the sins, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be held. We are free. We are free in Christ, and we are free indeed. This coming Friday, we're going to assemble here um, and uh, share a time of worship, share a time of teaching, assemble next door, and uh, have a time of uh, fellowship together. And prior to that Friday evening, we got a lot of time to take and go forward and be his hands and feet, right? Does he need us to be his hands and feet? God has no need of anything. Does he desire that we be his hands and feet? Absolutely. So as we end in worship, go out, ask the Lord to say, Lord, I don't know who you're going to bring in my path, but whoever it is, just give me the desire to just love them with your word. Amen.